Hey, hey, what's up you amazing hackers? My name is the XSS Rat and today I'm going to prove to you why that is my name. First of all, we're going to talk a lot about cross-site scripting in this one, so let's talk about the agenda first, shall we? What actually is cross-site scripting? Well, you will be surprised because a lot of people think cross-site scripting happens predominantly in JavaScript, exclusively in JavaScript even. You're wrong about that. A lot of people think that cross-site scripting is all about HTML tag injection. You're wrong about that. Um, and there's so much more we'll talk about. So we'll talk a lot about those contexts that we just talked about. We'll talk about the types of cross-site scripting. We'll only go over reflected, stored and DOM in this video. I know that there are a lot more, but I advise you to do your own research on those. And how to test for cross-site scripting. This is going to be the most important part, of course, because this is going to be the cross-site scripting methodology a little bit. And then a lot of you have probably encountered these filters in the wild. You might be wondering, okay, how do I get around them? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And raising your impact, the most important thing. If you're unable to do that, it's not even useful to look for cross-site scripting. So what is cross-site scripting. Well, in its core, it says it all, it's cross-site scripting. So it happens in scripting languages, but it's not JavaScript exclusive. And that's pretty important to know because XSS attacks are possible in VBScript, ActiveX, Flash, and CSS, and even more than that. But yes, it's true. JavaScript happens most commonly. Cross-site scripting happens most commonly in JavaScript, I mean, of course. So what it actually allows an attacker to do is they can insert their own client-side script, which can execute arbitrary client-side scripting code, which is not good. This might happen because a developer forgets to sanitize the input. And we're going to talk a lot more about that later. But first, a little bit more about those contexts that we already discussed. So JavaScript has a lot of cross-site scripting and we're going to focus a lot on javascript in this video but again there's more options than just javascript for cross-site scripting and it's really interesting to take a deep dive into those other types of scripting languages and see how they interact with cross-site scripting i would highly advise you to do that amazing hacker so first of all cross-site scripting can happen for example in the javascript code you've probably heard about seen about that it can happen between html tags that's also an important one it can happen between the html tag attributes that's also pretty a good one a lot of you probably heard about the html tags and the html attributes i don't know if a lot of you've heard about the javascript code but it's probably a little bit more niche cross-site scripting can also happen in the javascript template liberals it can happen in the context of the Angular JavaScript sandbox. It can happen in CSS, in the headers. It can happen in so many places. It's freaking amazing. Now today we'll only talk about the context of JavaScript, the HTML tag attributes and HTML tags. First of all, the JavaScript context. I'm going to give you guys an example of code here. So as you guys can see, let me put my pointer up here. Let me get my pen. Oh no, sorry. I mean, let me get my highlighter. So you have a constant poem here. And this poem is just a little string. And you also have a constant author. And in this constant author, we're going to make a prompt to enter your name with a default of Harry Potter. Okay, simple code. Very, very simple. And then we're going to make that into a new variable. And in this new variable, we're going to add these specific variables that we already had, such as poem and offer now what might happen here is since i am within the javascript context here i might insert some malicious code into the prompt which would lead me to execute a cross-site scripting attack so we can insert a backtick in here and that's this specific character and that allows it to break outside of the JavaScript function. If we go back real quick, they use backticks. And if we insert our own backtick, then the complete JavaScript function is going to be broken. And that means we can also insert our own JavaScript code. So if we insert an attack factor like this into the code example that we just witnessed, it allows us to break out of the JavaScript function with this 
single quote. It's a back tick, sorry about that. And then we execute an alert function. Now I written alert in here on purpose because guys, alert is the most filtered word out there. Try to use something different like confirm or whatever. Make it good so that it's not as filtered as alert. I put it in here so I could talk about it, but make sure that you don't use alert. And then of course we need to put the rest of the code into comments as well so that we don't break it. Now, when we go into the HTML tag attributes, that's also a pretty interesting one. Another code example for you guys here. We have, for example, again, a prompt that's going to pop up and this variable is going to be inserted into an attribute tag. This is basically an input and this input is going to load and this JavaScript error, this JavaScript handler is going to make sure that when it loads, the value of the input is going to be the name that we entered. And that's pretty bad because if the developer does not sanitize their input properly here, we can again put in a double quote and escape what they're actually trying to put us in, which is this specific tag attribute here. So when we want to break out of it, all we have to do is enter a double quote and then we end the input tag and then we can insert our own in, uh, HTML tags in there. It's as simple as that. It allows us to execute our own ex arbitrary JavaScript code and we can break out of our input if it's not sanitized. And I keep saying sanitized because if you're a developer watching this, sanitize your input, please. And then you can also, of course, have directly HTML tag insertion, which would look something like this. For example, you have a document here with a title and then you have a like this, you have a header, you have a little script in here. It's going to prompt you for your name and it's going to set the inner HTML. Uh, now, this is an example of DOM cross-site scripting, which we'll talk about later because it sets the inner HTML here. It's going to be directly into the HTML. So we can, for example, insert a script tag in here or a image source equals X tag with an error handler in there, which would look something like on error equals alert, for example. But again, don't use alert, use confirm. So we can insert that kind of stuff in here and it would directly put that script tag in here, that image tag in here, or whatever tag we decide to insert. So we can insert our own HTML tags, make it a JavaScript executing ta tag, execute arbitrary JavaScript code, and then execute our cross-site scripting attack. It's as simple as that. And I keep saying it's simple. It's a joke, of course. I know it's not at all. XSS goes very, very deep and it's freaking amazing. That's why I love it so much. Now the XSS context in the HTML attribute, I put an example in here. I'm going to put the input image source equals X on error equals confirm. And then I'm going to put that input uh, into my document. You can use input script, for example, as well. You can use a video tag. You can use uh, so many different objects there. It's insane. Um, let's talk a little bit about the types of cross-site scripting, shall we? Now, there are basically three main attack types out there and we're going to talk about them. I know there are many, many more and I call them smaller ones here, but that's technically not correct. I should have said many, many more less researched ones. That doesn't mean they're less prevalent in the wild, of course. So maybe interesting topic for you to research, dear viewer. There are three main attack types, the reflected cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting, which also includes blind cross-site scripting, by the way, and then DOM cross-site scripting. We'll talk about reflected, stored, and DOM, and blind will be in a separate video. Now, as for the types of reflected cross-site scripting, what we have here is the user input gets basically reflected. It can be from a get parameter, can be from a post parameter, can be from, a, from anything. Uh, no, that's wrong actually. It's always from a get parameter. My 
apologies for that. And then that user input gets reflected into an HTML tag or into the HTML page or into the JavaScript context or whatever. And this input, it's important to note that it doesn't get stored in the database. It's only reflected on the page. So it's also important to note that if the user input is not properly sanitized, and ooh, sorry about that guys, in this instance, that you have a problem on your hands. If your user input contains JavaScript code, then it's easily executed and you have a cross-site scripting attack factor in there. So about stored cross-site scripting, these values do get stored into the database. They get reflected from that database and get rendered onto your page or into HTML tag attribute or into your JavaScript context or whatever. And it's basically the same as reflected cross-site scripting. If your user input is not sanitized, you're going to have a problem there's three places it can be sanitized at the input, at the write to the database, at the read from the database. If it is not sanitized at any of those locations and the user input contains malicious JavaScript code, then there's a problem with cross-site scripting again, of course. As for DOM cross-site scripting, this is a separate beast in and of itself. It's really hard to look for manually. Burp scanner has a really good methodology for looking for it but manual looking is really much, pretty much impossible unless you're really, really good at this kind of stuff and you're really comfortable knowing, reading and executing JavaScript code. So what I have for you is an example here. For example, var search is a variable that we are going to store our document element by ID. This is just an identifier, just an object that we're getting. The value of, this is just an HTML tag on our page, which we're getting the value of. And then we're getting the same thing for results, document.getElement by ID. Again, we're getting that tag, that specific HTML tag. And then we set the results.innerHTML. Now that inner HTML, that's going to be our DOM sync. And that's going to be important because if we are looking at those DOM syncs, it's where user input enters the document object model, such as the eval, the inner HTML, and all of those different functions. I would highly advise you to look them up. I'm not going to go over each of them separately, but there are quite a lot of them. And most common sources of those DOM cross-site scripting events are going to be the windows.location. And this is from a port swigger research. All of this is based on port swigger research, by the way. So I would highly advise you guys to go check it out for yourself. It's amazing and very, very deep, much deeper than this course can go even. So I highly advise you guys to check it out. Now for this DOM cross-site scripting, that arises from the window.location, it usually arises from the query string or the fragment portion of the URL. Now, if you're curious what that looks like, it's like this little question mark in here and this little pound sign. We're going to look at it more later in detail, and then I'm going to tell you guys what it is exactly.